All right. Let's just wait a few more minutes so that we can have all the others come in and join us. All right, in the interest of time, we can start. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Grace Casaclan Versosa, and I'm honored to moderate today's cardiology grand rounds. So just a quick reminder. Uh, to claim your CME credit, please text 12479 to the, tele to the telephone number 888. 816-4893, and you have to claim your CME credit within 20, 12 hours after the session ends. And you should text it, text it as an SMS message, not an I message if you are using iOS, okay? And step two, to claim MOC points, this is for physicians only, you have to complete step one and answer a brief question, and you have to use room code future 23. So you have to use this link or you just have to scan this QR code to get you to your MOC points. All right. Okay. Just sharing that. So this is also being recorded. So everyone will have a chance to view this presentation at a later time. So it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker and panelist. Dr. Deepa Ayer is, a board certified, is board certified in advanced heart failure, ventricular assist device, and cardiac transplant. She is an assistant professor of medicine at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, the medical director for the VAD program, and the program director of the heart transplant program at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Dr. Ayur's clinical and research interests include the management of patients in cardiogenic shock with mechanical support, LV recovery after LVAT implantation, immunology, pre and post heart transplantation, infiltrative cardiomyopathy, including amyloid, pulmonary hypertension, and peripartum cardiomyopathy. Dr. Ayur loves to teach and has mentored many fellows, students, residents, and even nurse practitioners. She participates in transformational leadership at the hospital to incorporate protocols that will improve survival of our patients in cardiogenic shock. She is also looking into the use of AI, artificial intelligence, to ensure access to care for heart failure patients, early detection of disease, and optimization of therapies. 
Her talk today is entitled Cardiogenic Shock, Clinical Pearls and Evolving Paradigms of Treatment. She will discuss the use of temporary circulatory support and multidisciplinary approach to shock. Our panelist today is Dr. Ken Dunuan, one of our heart failure specialists. Dr. Dunuan is tra uh, completed his training at the University of Kentucky and was an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Louisville before joining us here in Robert Wood. And most importantly, he is my kababayan. So without further ado, Dr. Ayer, please. Thank you, Grace, uh, for that introduction. It's been an honor to be here. Okay, uh, we'll get started. So my topic today is cardiogenic shock, clinical pearls and evolving paradigms of treatment. I have no conflicts of interest for this talk. That's right, you do you wanna share your slides? Oh, okay. Okay, are you able to see it now? Yes. Um, so I have no disclosures. Um, so the purpose of this talk is threefold, to define and identify cardiogenic shock, uh, treatment options for cardiogenic shock, and then again, introduce the shock team, multidisciplinary team approach. When we talk about defining cardiogenic shock, we've had multiple definitions from the shock trial, the IABP shock 2 trial, as well as the European Society of Cardiology Heart Failure Guidelines. However, to make it simple, the definition that we use is a hemodynamic definition, which includes marked and persistent systemic hypotension, defined as systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury for at least 30 minutes, or the use of pressors or inotropes to maintain systolic blood pressure greater than 90. We, when we have a swan gans catheter in place, it's basically defined as a reduction of cardiac index less than 2.2. In addition to that, elevated left ventricular filling pressures with a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure greater than 18. For those in the cath lab, we have the cardiac power Output, which is defined as mean arterial pressure multiplied by cardiac output uh, uh, divided by 451, if it is less than 0.6, indicating LV failure, and the pulmonary artery pulsatility index, which is an uh, indication for RV function, if it is less than one, indicating RV failure. And again, clinically, when you know systemic hypotension along with evidence of end organ perfusion is definitely what defines ca cardiogenic shock, including al altered mental status, cool extremities, uh, reduction in uh, urine output, elevated lactate less greater than two and acidosis. So etiology is multifold. The most common cause is um, AMI, acute myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock. We could also have valvular causes, which is acute ischemic mitral regurgitation or ventricular septal or free wall rupture as a complication following AMI. And any other cause of acute ventricular dysfunction, we see post-cardiotomy, we see acute fulminant myocarditis and stage cardiomyopathy with decompensation. Uh, cardiogenic shock caused by incessant refractory prolonged tachyarrhythmias, post-cardiac arrest, pulmonary embolism for the right side, severe valve valvular heart disease, and again, iotic dissection with acute severe AI, some of the, some of the etiologies for cardiogenic shock. Um, I like this cartoon because it really tells us what's the current concept, you know, for the pathophysiology. So it st all starts with, you know, an initial insult. It could be myocardial infarction. It could be myocardial dysfunction, you know, where there is a decrease in the systolic function. So there is a decrease in the cardiac output and stroke volume that in turn causes a decrease in systemic perfusion. So it's a hyperperfusion uh, environment. Decrease in stroke volume also causes hypotension. It causes decrease in coronary perfusion pressure and predisposes further to ischemia. 
On the other hand, when you have uh, diastolic dysfunction, there is increase in LVEDP, there's pulmonary congestion, it backs up into the lungs, you have further hypoxia and ischemia. And ultimately, the compensatory mechanisms, you know, come into place as well as we have to remember there is a systemic inflammatory response as well that causes inadvertently towards the end, the more time the person is in shock, what is called as a vasodilatory state. Eventually, there is progressive myocardial dysfunction and death. Again, if there is early capture, you know, in terms of those who have acute myocardial infarction and they're revascularized, there is relief of ischemia, but that's not all to it in, cardio, uh, in cardiogenic shock pathophysiology. I like this slide because it shows us the mechanistic drivers of different shock phenotypes. Again, starting with an initial uh, insult, which causes low cardiac output. That translates to hypoperfusion, hypotension, but then it also stimulates a whole array in the body, including uh, the microcirculatory dysfunction. You have metabolic dysregulation, you have coagulation upregulation, you have immune dysfunction, you can have concurrent infection, you have the activation of the SIRS, and you are vasoplegic. And with all of of these, there are various malperfusion phenotypes which ultimately lead to multi organ failure and death. Again, hypoperfusion is caused by increased catecholamines, which actually initially is a mechanism to cause uh, peripheral arterial vasoconstriction and maintain perfusion to vital organs. Vasopressin and angiotensin levels too increase, which increases coronary and peripheral perfusion, but ultimately causes increase in systemic vascular resistance, leading to further LV impairment because of decreased LV unloading. There's an activation of neurohormonal cascade, which initially promotes salt and water retention and helps to increase perfusion initially, but that's at the cost of worsening pulmonary edema later, and different reflex mechanisms that increase systemic vascular resistance and further exacerbate, you know, hypoperfusion. The systemic inflammatory response is an inappropriate vasodilatation that is seen as time in shock increases. This is a systemic vascular resistance less than 900 despite pressors. Because of this, you know, this, um, it's thought to be due to different factors along with release of the IL-6 as well as nitric oxide, but there's also impaired perfusion of the GI tract and because of which there is transmigration of bacteria, you know, there is sepsis that further causes vasodilatory state. And again, the risk for SIRS increases with the duration of shock. So historically, when we talk about outcomes around 20 years ago, the mortality was quoted as 70 to 90% following early revascularization strategies post uh, at least acute myocardial infarction, the mortality came down to around 50%, but still pretty high. Early predictors for risk factors for higher mortality included older age, female sex, uh, of course, a lady territory or a large, you know, a widow maker MI, multivessel CAD, a history of cardiomyopathy and stage cardiomyopathy, as well as diabetes. When we talk about, you know, the current, um, you know, um, the, the existing medical treatment for shock, this included vasoactive medications. We used both inotropes, such as uh, milrinone and dobutamine, as well as pressors. And again, they had hemodynamic effects where the pressors, you know, increased uh, the mean arterial pressure, they increased the heart rate. And, um, you know, in terms of inotropes, including increasing the cardiac output. However, we will soon find that there is a limitation of these conventional therapies. We knew back as far back in 1999, when Samuels published in the Journal of Cardiac Surgery, that the risk of in-hospital mortality increased with escalating doses of either inotropes or pressors, to which when this was a moderate dose was considered a dose less than five mics you know, of a pressor or a low dose of a single inotrope, the mortality was 7.5% and dramatically increased to 80% with three high dose use of pressors or inotropes. Again, we are now in 2016, where we look at uh, the mortality and number of inotropes from the percutaneous VAD registry and pretty much, you know, has the same outcome. You know, the mortality increases as the number of inotropes and pressors increase. So clearly this is a big limitation of conventional therapies. So the first time that people looked at, you know, national trends in the utilization of short-term mechanical circuitry support devices, and what they found is that over the years from 2004, 2005, you know, to 2011, and this was, you know, done in 2014, that there was a trend towards decrease in mortality from 60% initially for recipients, who required, you know, who had received short-term circuitry supports to around 30 to 40%, and this was promising. 
Um, also have to talk about Intermax profile. So Intermax is actually a registry, interagency registry for mechanical assisted circulatory support devices for all those patients who end up getting a durable VAD. This registry was started in the University of Alabama in 2005. And since 2015, it's been part of the STS uh, 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 platform. Now, what is important here is that early on, you know, uh, people realized how to categorize risk profile of patients getting durable VADs. And so we have an inter max level one through seven, where basically four through seven are New York Heart Association uh, class four patients and class three patients. However, when you come to Intermax three, those are those patients who've already now been on inotropes. And then you have Intermax two when they are on inotropes, but they are sliding. They now require introduction of pressors. Maybe they are tending towards getting a temporary support device. And then Intermax one are those who are crashing and burning, who come in on inotropes, multiple pressors, endocrine failure. And the reason we identified this is because mortality is highest clearly in Intermax level one versus Intermax level three. And then the most recent classification, which was defined by uh, the Society of Coronary Angiography and Intervention, where you had stocks, uh, shock stages A through E, uh, and that was associated with increased you know, intensive care and hospital mortality. So towards the right, the cardiogenic shock stage, which came by Zenser and, uh, you know, back in 2019, which was presented at Sky, showed that uh, we had five stages. Stage A is those at risk. I mean, those they could be people who have uh, low, you know, low ejection fraction, but they are not hypotensive or tachycardic. They don't have any hypoperfusion. So at risk A. B is the beginning where they may have hypotension, but do not have hypoperfusion. They do not have cool extremities or oliguria. They do not have an elevated lactate. Stage C is the classic presentation where you have the definition of shock, hypoperfusion, where you have a, you know, a, a hypotension with hypoperfusion, but not deterioration. The end organ function is still relatively preserved. And then you have stage D on those who are deteriorating, but not refractory shock, where they do respond you know, to inotropes and pressors. And finally, the stage E, which is an extremist case where there is hypoperfusion, there is deterioration, and refractory shock. And these people, what is important is when it translated to observe mortality, uh, notice that how you know the mortality was highest in those with stage E. So we came to understand and that there is a difference you know, between different stages of shock and time in shock matters because it, it then translates into not only a hem hemodynamic uh, problem, but it becomes a hemometabolic problem with vasodilatation, with SIRS, and that further complicates you know, shock. So I like to quote Dr. Adam Scully, who was considered to be the father of trauma medicine and a pioneer on the management of shock. And he talked about and introduced the concept of the golden hour. He mentioned there's a golden hour between life and death. If you are critically injured, you have uh, around six, less than 60 minutes to survive. You may not die right then, but it may be three days or two weeks later, but whatever happened in the first 60 minutes is important because that may be irreparable. So with that in mind, we're going to and identifying what shock is, we're going to talk about the goals of management. So really, the goals of management in shock is twofold. Short term, we have to restore adequate perfusion to vital organs. I mean, that's important. You know, restore, you know, LV, uh, uh, coronary perfusion as well. And then in the long term, we have to unload the heart to minimize direct injury to the heart myocardium and also minimize irreversible end organ damage. So these are the goals of management. I love this slide by Naveen, Dr. Naveen Kapoor, who came in, you know, not too long ago to talk about the STEMI, you know, un, uh, unload trial, uh, where he talked about, you know, shock is not just one entity, it's multiple entities coming together. So we talk about circulatory supporting circulatory support, you know, maintaining systemic perfusion. It's all about ventricular support, where we have to unload the LV or the RV, if that's the culprit. We have to maintain coronary perfusion if it's in the setting of an AMI, and finally maintain end organ function function by renal and hepatic unloading. Again, uh, very, very important. You want to avoid it becoming a hemometabolic problem. So time in cardiogenic shock matters. And what he introduced the concept of primary unloading versus primary reperfusion. And what he mentioned was, you know, primary unloading followed by revascularization is extremely important because that really uh, makes sure that we have the upregulation of cardioprotective pathways and prevents apoptosis. So what is the data out there? 
we have a lot of data starting from you know 2016 where we uh, where we uh, they showed survival to one year in those patients where LV unloading pre PCI you know was much better 43% versus 13%. You had from the CVAD uh, study which were the percutaneous VAD study which was back in 2017 they talked about survival to 30 years so not only 30 days that there was an increased survival in those who had gotten LV unloading uh, prior to PCI. Talked about survival to discharge, similar outcomes. Talked about, again, survival to discharge. And then finally, survival to explant. So even those who have been implanted with temporary mechanical support devices, you know, uh, it was very important that pre-PCI, they had a better survival compared to those post-PCI. So this introduced the concept of LV unloading in a cardiogenic shock situation. Um, and that was the beginning of a different trend and paradigm shift. So we've already uh, heard this from Dr. Naveen Kapoor, but just to reiterate, what does LV, LV unloading do? So LV unloading really, what it does is it unloads the LV. So it decreases myocardial oxygen consumption. It actually increases cardiac microvascular perfusion into the infarct zone, very important. And then it causes hemodynamic stabilization. God forbid, should there be reperfusion arrhythmias. And during reperfusion, there's also myocardial stunning. So it protects the heart through this and reduces acute infarct size. This is what it actually does to the heart itself. And then, of course, it maintains perfusion. It maintains, you know, end organ function by maintaining perfusion. So it's really twofold. And this is the paradigm shift. So coming to what are the temporary support devices that we use in our, you know, uh, generally and especially in our hospitals. So we are we very uh, commonly use the impeller. It is basically an axial flow pump. You know, what it does is it unloads the LV, so removes blood from the LV and puts it back into the iota. Now, depending on the level of support and the way it is uh, uh, it is introduced, you have diff you know, LP 2.5 basically stands for the level of support. So LP 2.5 gives 2.5 liters of cardiac output, 3.5 is 3.5 liters, 5 and 5.5 are uh, uh, respectively, that's the cardiac output given. The 2.5 and 3.5 can be placed, you know, in the cat lab through a percutaneous approach, and the 5 and 5.5 requires a surgical cut down. Usually it is placed in the axillary artery. The advantage is there is, you know, better mobility and decreased risk of infection when the groin is spared. And then we also have uh, the impeller RP for right-sided support, as well as the Protec Geo. The advantage of that, again, is introduced through the neck and so spares the groin and allows for ambulation, which is extremely important for a patient. The tandem heart is not something we use here. Again, this is also another temporary uh, 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 mechanical circulatory support device. What it is, is it, um, you know, it unloads the right, the left atrium, thereby unloading the left ventricle. However, you know, so this is a centrifugal pump, pump that is used. Um, I think one of the main challenges of this technique is it requires a transeptal puncture. And so very often, you know, with the EP colleagues that are structural colleagues that is done. So again, it is a preference based on the center, depending on their level of expertise to pick and choose what is the best temporary support device for them. We definitely have the ECMO that can be placed both centrally and peripherally. It basically takes over the entire cardiac uh, pulmonary circulation. So here you are also ensure that there is oxygenation. Remember, the ECMO does not unload the left ventricle or the right ventricle. And so very often what happens is that you have, after a period of time, when there is passive blood flow into the left ventricle and it does not empty, the inherent function is not that great, you may have to put in a separate pump, maybe something that goes directly into the LV and empties out the LV, which is called as the venting phenomenon. Usually the impeller is used for such venting. Also, since the ECMO cannulas, especially the arterial cannulas are very big, there is, a, and they're usually introduced if there is a peripheral ECMO through the groin, through the femoral, there is a risk of lib ischemia on that side, and that has to be monitored. And sometimes, you know, we use um, either an antrogate, uh, 10 French catheter through the SFA or an eight French catheter retrograde to the posterior tibial in order to maintain perfusion of the leg where the arterial Channel of the echo is placed. And then we have surgically uh, inserted uh, biventricular support, which is a sentry mag, and it you know, supplies up to um, 10 liters of cardiac output. 
So that having been said, not all temporary mechanical circulatory support devices are equal. And I know I uh, did not talk about the balloon pump that has been our go-to temporary mechanical support device for a long time. You know, the balloon pump typically, you know, uh, is placed in the descending iota. You have the balloon uh, uh, stymed for inflation during diastole, but it increases um, coronary perfusion and your deflation, uh, sorry, uh, 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 it's, it's time for inflation during um, uh, uh, diastole where there is increased coronary perfusion and deflation during systole where it you know decreases uh, the systemic vascular resistance. That having been said, you know it only provides 0.3 to 0.5 liters per minute of cardiac flow, and um, you know very often we have now stayed away from it. It is definitely useful to provide a temporary uh, support as a bridge to decision before something else needs to be done. We do have balloon pumps which are implanted through the axilla, axillary artery, and they can stay there for a long time. And we've been very successful in our hospital doing that. Uh, Again, the uh, impeller, it basically is a bend, is, uh, it unloads the LV and you know, introduces blood into the iota. We talked about the tandem heart and the VA ECMO. So having said that, you know, what was important, the third part of my talk is going to talk about team-based care. So the first concept of team-based care came in this article in JAMA Surgery in July, 2016, where they talked about redesigning care for patients with acute myocardial infarction complicated by cardiogenic shock, the shock team. Uh, Garen and uh, Piruta Kayama was the one who took the lead on this. And then the question is, why a team approach? Well, for one, prior team experiences have been successful. We have been great at uh, handling, you know, uh, our rapid response teams for improved, uh, you know, early recognition and improved survival, the trauma team, the stroke teams. I think this was the main landmark paper that summarized, you know, what was the standardized team-based care for cardiogenic shock by Teherani, and this was published in 2019. Some of the highlights of this, they talked about why implement a shock team. Why? Because cardiogenic shock is a complex syndrome. High mortality stakes are high. Patient management still remains highly variable. And so shock team and protocols reduce this variation, help to early recognition, people come together and improve outcomes. This is a busy slide, but this was one of the first national cardiogenic shock initiative that was um, initiated at Detroit Henry Ford, and that spread to other centers. But I want to give you another slide where I will summarize what they did. So basically, uh, their go-to MCS was the impeller. And what they did was that uh, they basically started putting in all patients who came in with you know, cardiogenic shock in the setting of AMI, they introduced unloading first. So they put the impeller first, then went on to revascularize, and they did a right heart cap. Now, those who had a cardiac power output greater than 0.6 and a pulmonary artery pulsatility index greater than 0.9, if you recall an intact you know, LV function, and RV function, then at that point, they continued to just titrate down the pressors and inotropes. But for those who had a cardiac power output less than 0.6, um, and, um, you know, in those, they definitely thought about, you know, further, uh, you know, uh, continuation, you know, of the impeller support. And then for those who had a PAPI, which was persistently low, they considered RV support as well. And then they reiterated, they looked at, you know, weaning parameters. So this is what they did in the setting of AMI, where all of them got unloaded first, and then uh, the decision further to either keep it as a bridge to recovery or a bridge to another impeller, which is a 5.5, so that you get more support or a bridge to you know, uh, decision-making towards durable VAD or transplant, or a bridge, unfortunately, to palliative care. You know, all of these you know, were discussed. This was the first one, and a lot of centers have been part of this. And then uh, what they found is historically, with these collaborators, the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative collaborators, they published that uh, classically, when the survival was just 17% in 1973 for these cohort of patients, with what they did with the shock team approach, the survival was a whopping 72%. Another one initiative was the cardiogenic shock algorithm, and this is from the Innova Heart and Vascular Institute. Similar concepts, but they expanded identifying shock to not just those patients with cardiogenic shock with AMI, but also with non-AMI cardiogenic shock in a similar platform. Again, remember the right heart cath was key to early identification, and then there was a shock team approach where they came together and then decided what was the best case scenario for percutaneous mechanical circulatory support. 
again, what's interesting is look at um, the numbers. So we had, it went live in 2016, and then they did a, a you know, interim analysis in 2018, once they had the shock team go live for around uh, one and a half years. And what did they find? What, uh, sorry, what they found is that in 2016, you know, when you talk about uh, survival, survival was 47%. When you go, and this is, um, uh, you know, this is the beginning. And then they divided the red stands for those who have had acute myocardial infarction, and the blue is for all of those who came in with acute decompensated heart failure cardiogenic shock. So notice, 44% in January 2017 went up to 82%. 59.6% went up to 72.2%. This was whopping results just by implementation of the shock team. And um, not only that, there was also improved survival with early support. They realized that time to support is essential. You know, initially when they came in, you know, in the first hour, they found that there was a 27% chance of death in the first hour following shock. And that increases to 75% chance of death at 32 hours. So when they calibrated, they came to a conclusion that there is a 9.9% .9 increase in mortality for every hour the patient is in shock. And that was pretty dramatic. So coming to, they also looked at factors associated with mortality and as expected, pressors at diagnosis. So longer the duration of pressors at diagnosis, greater than 36 hours, patients had worse, you know, 30-day uh, mortality. Those who have had elevated lactate, greater than three. Cardiac power uh, output, you know, at 24 hours, less than 0.6. PAPI at 24 hours, less than one, which we already know comes in the definition. And all of these, you know, which we already recognize were associated with higher mortality, but timing was extremely extremely important. Again, the Innova Heart and Vascular Institute actually based on this findings came up with a cardiogenic shock risk score and the probability of to define 30 day mortality based on this. So the risk factors included a lactate, the pressors duration from diagnosis, how long they've been on pressors, cardiac power output, and then some others that came into play with those patients with diabetes, dialysis, those who had had a, a PAPI, which is a surrogate for RV function less than one, as well as age greater than 71. So the scoring system system was two, two, two for the top three, and then one each. So it's a total of 10. So again, the 30-day mortality risk, remember, for somebody who is zero to one uh, is hardly anything, and it goes all the way up to 82% for those with a score of five or zero. So this was absolutely recognized. That what is the chance of this patient surviving at the time of our, their initial assessment? And again, they recognized care variation. They found out that you know, prior to that, they had fractured care because there was no formal process for multidisciplinary evaluation. Uh, patients were too sick, too late. They were detected too late. There was impaired access to care. There were delays in transfer of the patient within the system itself and late recognition. And then there were variations in care depending on you know, monitoring, reassessment strategies, individual, you know, individual decisions. And so that is why it's really important to ask the question, what therapies can our, your center deliver 24 seven? I mean, clearly we are a level one uh, quaternary center, a large academic medical center. We have multiple percutaneous and surgical support devices like I enumerated. We have a full-fledged durable van and transplant program. And we you know, have a cardiac arrest and we should have e e uh, ECLS protocols. Again, you know, it's very important to identify level three, level two, which are the intermediate tier, and then finally, the level one. And that's important to identify before we start about, you know, talking about a shock team. And so really what the identification is when we are a level one center, you know, the key members of the shock team, you know, it should be a team that is available 24, 7, 365 days a year to anybody who should require an urgent shock consult. And it's, in, you know, it includes cardiovascular surgery, cardiac critical care specialists, interventional cardiology, advanced heart failure. In specific cases, when patients come in with VT storm, will include electrophysiologists. And of course, you know, we cannot do without nursing directors doctors, technicians, perfusionists. I mean, it is basically, you know, a whole uh, village that takes to make the cardiogenic shock team. And so when they define or we define a pathway for instituting a shock program, you know, first one is that there has to be an institutional and a specialty specific buy-in, right? There has to be a clear agreement between all key stakeholders regarding what are the indications, what are the contraindications, what are our goals for the shock team? And when we talk about a shock team approach, it cannot be only during the daytime or at 
night, there has to be 24 7, 365 multidisciplinary cardiogenic shock team in operation. Again, there are certain key issues. We have to uh, talk about activation of the shock team, whether it be through the operator, it'll be through the transfer center. We have to talk about coordination of care, especially for the hub and spoke model. And then again, delivery throughputs and logistics. And then there would always be equipment issues, inventory issues, where certain things are going to be done. And then, you know, we have to have the buy in of all the people participating, nursing, technicians, perfusionist support, you know, ICU care, and then clear protocols in place for where the place will be where the patient goes and what is the weaning protocol and what will happen and how long people will follow. And so I like this uh, slide because the shock team is bigger than what we all think. You know, the shock team is in the crux. You have, you know, the transfer center. The transfer center talk calls the shock team. The shock team makes a decision, you know, with where the patient goes. Is the patient going to require uh, unloading and revascularization in the cath lab? Or is he going to go to the OR? Or is this a patient with just advanced heart failure who would need a bigger unloading and a plan to decision making with, you know, advanced therapies? Again, you know, the ED is involved. You have, you know, the community hospitals, which are basically dependent to save their patients. And so early recognition is key. And there is this coordination of all these people that come together. So it's really a big thing that we're talking about here. And so when we talk about cardiogenic shock scorecard, I think the score is early recognition. We're talking about timely therapy. We make a decision early on about the time of mechanical, about the type of mechanical circuitry support device that is used and considered. Of course, the PA catheter becomes the uh, gold standard for every patient who has a temporary MCS to be able to um, identify as well as follow through and help with we. Uh, the shock deep activation, we talk about appropriate escalation because it's not just a one-time shock team, but, you know, they follow them longitudinally over time. And then again, the whole idea we do all this is because it is possible to have a great outcome and change outcomes. And so really quickly, you know, I'm going to just go over, you know, this is a, uh, this is a, a work in progress. We definitely hope that we will see it through. Uh, you know, we are uh, going to institute our own hospital cardiogenic shock program soon. And again, our mission and goals are similar to what is already, you know, reiterated. Our goals are rapid patient identification, early right heart cath, appropriate MCS device selection. We want to assist in defining appropriate treatment strategies as part of a multidisciplinary team and there will be longitudinal patient follow-up and we will document quality measures. Um, and the definition of shock is similar to what I already said. The shock team, I think this is the crux, our mechanism of activation. I think that's kind of some of the challenges and notification of the shock team. We propose two types. Those patients who, uh, you know, we get a call from outside, any of the stakeholders, whether it's an interventional cardiologist or a critical care specialist or a heart failure specialist or a surgeon, even, you know, either they call one of them and then we call the transfer center or they call the transfer center directly. It is a responsibility of the transfer center to have a one phone call, you know, to all the members of the shock team, which are available 24 seven. And then the whole idea is that after the multidisciplinary phone discussion, within 10 minutes, we would be able to make a decision whether the patient is going to be transferred or not transferred. This is for all those patients who come in from the peripheral hospitals because we are their hub. For inpatient referral, it's going to go to our in-hospital uh, in operator. So the in-hospital operator calls a code medical alert code shock screen. And then uh, the primary people are our cardiology fellows and the CCO team, maybe the cardiothoracic surgery team, if it's a post-cardiotomy or a surgical patient, they come in, evaluate the patient. If they feel it's appropriate, then they call you know, the shock team again, and then they have a multidisciplinary phone discussion you know, with all the stakeholders in the game. Uh, again, if uh, the only time this differs is if the patient is already in the CVICU or in the CCU, we have a, a SWAN in place and we know the cardiac power output is already low, then in that event, it would be directly, you know, calling the shock team stakeholders to decide what the next steps are. And then once the shock team is contacted, it would be an expedited decision. So the whole idea is whether you listen to what is going on, is it a go, 
or a no-go for temporary MCS. So what is a go patient? A go patient is somebody who has a insult, but he could be potentially treated. Maybe this is somebody who's come in with decompensated heart failure, and you know, maybe he will eventually be somebody who would be a candidate for recovery or a candidate, you know, for durable bladder transplant. And we have an exit plan. So that is what it is: recovery or revascularization or a durable bladder transplant. And the expected time will be an evaluation to support time will be less than 90 minutes. That's what we hope to achieve. No go is when that shock has progressed, the time in shock has increased. So it's come to a point where there is less likelihood of success. I mean, the lactate is already elevated. He's already in end organ failure. He's now in sepsis. And so there is no exit strategy. So that would be a no go. And then once it is a go, then the shock team, the advantage is not only they say whether it's a go or no go, but they also determine where is the best place this patient is surge. Is it going to be in the cath lab? Is it going to be in the OR? Is it going to remain in the CCU and, you know, uh, put in, you know, uh, the next step? So usually these are the things that are, you know, going to be uh, talked about. And again, a go does not clearly need to be MCS. Even if it's a no-go for MCS, you know, there would be, should the patient be transferred or should the patient stay here in the CCU? So it's basically optimizing management. Again, indications for acute MCS in a shock team go versus no-go is a definition of shock. And it could be in patients, again, with AMI, refractory VTVF, post-cardiac surgery failure, early graft failure, post-transplant, a bridge to decision, when you're just waiting to see if that would improve you know, end organ function. So these are things that we've already gone through before. And then I think the, this is where the contraindications, the no-go, uh, where we are not going to put an MCS is on the gray zone, but uh, that's something we could definitely socialize. Uh, you know, when there is active malignancy with life expectancy less than one year, you know, there is severe aortic valve regurgitation, aortic dissection, usually it's a surgical, you know, issue. And if there is any current intracranial hemorrhage, severe peripheral vascular disease, advanced chronic liver disease, advanced, you know, respiratory failure. So uh, with home or two dependence, again, these are things that can be discussed and socialized. And then relative contraindications also. But in general, I know that when we talked about shock programs all over the country, patients with end-stage renal disease, those who are morbidly obese, weight greater than 140, because um, in the advanced therapies world, usually a BMI of greater than of, uh, you know, 40 is uh, not really considered an ideal candidate for transplant therapies or VAD. And so all of these things definitely, you know, come into place. And then again, when you activate, you know, the uh, shock team, if there is invasive monitoring, like I said, you directly call the, uh, you know, shock team stakeholders. If there is no invasive monitoring, then there is an assessment by the CCU team and the cardiology fellows, plus minus the CTS APNs if it is a surgical patient. And... Uh, uh, finally, you know, if there is follow up, you know, once consulted, this shock team will continue to follow as a consultative service till discharge or till the patient is stable. And, you know, if they are going towards advanced therapies and established relationship with the heart failure team. And again, post discharge, they will still be followed in the clinic in the appropriate clinic. They've gotten revascularization by interventional, you know, cardiology and so forth and so forth. And then those who have come from outside, those hospital, um, uh, the referral, the referral cardiologists or, you know, the uh, consultant consultants will have, uh, will have feedback, you know, they will know exactly what happened to their patient, you know, how did they do, what was the type of MCS that was done. I mean, it is fascinating, I can tell you, for when you have a, a person on the outside trying to, you know, uh, transfer a patient here, when you, within 10 minutes, you get five caregivers who are specialists coming up with a uh, plan of whether this patient, you know, is a candidate or not. I mean, that itself is very impressive, you know, uh, for the hospital. And then again, quality measures will be adoption of a one call shock activation, which is uh, we will look at it that how many of such has happened since institution, a absolute 100% utilization of a right heart cath. And then we look at 30 day survival. There could be other measures that we could look at as well. The time of call, time of intervention, the time of intervention, what's the risk score and what, they, what happened you know, further downstream uh, and survival at seven, 30 days. And then it's also a continuous process in improvement. We can have monthly meetings. We can start our own registry. So really, I think in summary, what we talked about today is, you know, we have to suspect cardiogenic shock, understand the definition, understand the clinical signs, confirm it. If there is a, a, a concern, you know, confirm that, you know, I think if you can do invasive hemodynamics, absolutely, and then activate the shock team approach. 
And so I think the new paradigm shift is it's no longer just a you know, door to balloon or you know, just inotropes it's a, or expressors. It's a door to swan because key is early recognition and it's a door to support. And so again, just reiterating the team approach. Why? Because there is high risk clinical condition with various complexities and etiologies and the stakes are high, high mortality. Time matters, time in shock matters. Early intervention helps the patient. Uh, they truly require multidisciplinary collaborative care. And then we need to understand downstream resources, continuum of care, and then it helps to have a clear goal, implement standardized protocols and practices, and it reduces error and improves safety. And then we have opportunities to reflect on what we do and review and improve quality so that we can help the sickest of patients. I think with that, that uh, concludes my shock. I'm sharing some of our patient stories that came in in cardiogenic shock. The patient to the left, you know, had um, um, a durable left ventricular assist device initially, and then was uh, as a bridge to transplant and is now transplanted. The a patient to the right, you know, again, came in cardiogenic shock, had an impeller 5.5, which was then uh, changed over to a durable VAD, and he actually got his transplant as well. Um, and then we have this patient who came in in cardiogenic shock, and he uh, uh, was supported, and then he he ultimately was transitioned to a durable left ventricular assist device. I mean, this is him on his wedding day, and you don't even know that he is having, he's currently, you know, on the wait list, awaiting a heart transplant, and he became a father early this year. So, you know, and we also have several, several examples of patients with bridge to recovery. So this does save lives, this does help. So I'm going to quote Dr. Naveen Kapoor on this. Shock uh, you know, know the prognostic factors of a patient in shock, but it is reversible potentially when recognized early. And, uh, and, and that's it. And thank you um, for all your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Deepa Ayer. That was a very exhaustive discussion of heart failure, including the definition, how do you identify, and also the, especially the multidisciplinary approach to treatment. So with that, I also would like to congratulate you, Dr. Debaye, for all the success of the heart failure program. I think you have touched many lives. And I also want to commend you for the fact that even during the COVID pandemic, you were still able to do a heart transplant without complications. I think that's a really big feat. So uh, Dr. I'll call on Dr. Duan. Dr. Del Nuan, would you like to uh, respond to and uh, say something about the discussion to Dr. Uh, Ayer's um, presentation? And I also would like, I would have like to invite also the other doctors who are in attendance to also please feel free to say your comments or ask questions to our presenter. Dr. Dunua. Yep. Hey, Dr. Ayer, congratulations. And thank you for that very thorough, very comprehensive review of uh, the topic of cardiogenic shock. So from your talk, I really am convinced uh, that we absolutely as an institution should have a, a shock protocol. Um, what do you think are the unique challenges in our system in having one? So that's my first question. Uh, two more questions. Is there any role, at least in your practice, for balloon pump? Or do you think balloon pump is an old device that we should stop using? And third, is there any use for all these uh, other semi-invasive um, hemodynamic machines like the Vigileo and FlowTrack in caring for patients with cardiogenic shock? Um. Um, thank you. First of all, I would like to um, um, let Grace know that, you know, yes, we, we were open in 2020 with only transplant center that was open, but kudos to uh, my entire team, including Dr. Dulman, Dr. Moyne, you know, the hospital administration for really making that happen. It truly takes a village to do what we do. Um, that having been said, um, Dr. Dulman, I think you had three questions. Um, so the first one is what are some of the unique challenges, you know, of implementing a short program in our hospital? I mean, I think like, uh, like, we like other programs have experienced, I think there has to be complete buy-in. There has to be a clear recognition, you know, of the role. Some of the challenges would be, for example, you know, where is the right heart cath going to be placed in a patient who comes in, you know, with uh, uh, it, it, uh, to the ED and acute decompensated heart failure. I know that at this point, you know, they will have to activate the cath lab, you know, to go there. Uh, again, I think some of the challenges is, you know, who is going to place the ECMOs. I know that, uh, you know, we 
have, uh, we are expanding to see that like most can be placed in the cat lab, you know, by the interventional cardiologist. So I think some of them is just who's going to do it. Some of them is just placement of, you know, where things are going to be. But really, I think it is also about education. I mean, like, uh, you know, we said the shock team is much bigger than all of us. And I think that you need everybody's buy-in, including um, nursing directors, perfusionists, you know, so location matters. And then I think there are small things about, you know, getting uh, set up. But I think these are the ma major challenges where everybody has to be, you know, the things have to be defined as to who's going to do it and where they're going to be done. And education is a big part of, um, you know, understanding why we are implementing the shock program. Definitely. And the good thing is, you know, we have referring uh, institutions that are actually capable of uh, implanting a balloon pump or an right. impella. So from the get go, they would be able to give us the numbers and you know, reach out to one of the team members and make a decision even before moving the patient uh, here. And then I think you had two additional, you know, questions. Yes. One, was, one was the balloon pump. You know, that's a tough question. So um, I, I don't think the balloon pump is going to go redundant. I mean, as both of us know, we have used a lot of um, the balloon pumps through the axillary position because that little bit amount of cardiac, you know, output does help in maintaining end organ perfusion, helps in maintaining, you know, the blood pressures and also, um, you know, is a very safe uh, way uh, to make sure that the patients, you know, are supported while they are waiting, you know, for a suitable heart. Um, uh, would it be, um, you know, I think that we should definitely move away from a groin balloon pump because, again, the groin balloon pump is just what it is supposed to do. Yes, it saves lives. I mean, if your patient, patient has acute ischemic MR, you put in a balloon pump and you're going to stabilize the person. But we have to understand that that is not a long term you know, support. Anything which is greater than 48 hours, then you either it's weaned off or it would be a transition to bigger support. And I think that's really you know where it is. I think the actually balloon pump definitely uh, is helpful in that it helps the patient ambulate, there's a decreased risk of infection. So I do believe that there is a role for axillary balloon pump, especially in those patients who need support and who are waiting for a potential heart. Yeah. For my last question, let me just paraphrase it. You know, now that there is, you know, nationwide heart failure physicians are criticized for recommending right heart caths for everyone mm -hmm. and so on placement. Are we there yet when uh, we can actually make our decisions based on, you know, hemodynamics from an echo or from a flow track? So I think that we are, I mean, it, could it be done? Yes, we, it could be done. You know, are we there yet is your question? I don't think so. And I think that um, we still rely on certain things, you know, for accurately measuring. I mean, invasive hemodynamics, for example, you know, when we talk about, uh, yes, the echo can give us what the cardiac output is, but, you know, what the TAPSI is. But I think there are certain things that, you know, with invasive hemodynamics, especially when we have a mixed picture, you know, that's when it's really key. I mean, these patients don't just come in in cardiogenic shock. I mean, you know, you realize that, you know, they are vaso and, you know, they are hypotensive, you know, because of um, uh, SIRS and because of transmigration of gut bacteria. So I, uh, can it be done? I think it can be done. I think there has to be a protocolization. I, I uh, you know, there has to be practice. So maybe as we have our right heart cats, you know, they have, you know, we can also train for the, um, you know, specific echoes and a certain protocol to be done so that we can get those numbers. But uh, I'm biased towards uh, a PA catheter. So uh, I think that uh, there is some information that you know, is absolutely essential that we get from the PA catheter. Thank you, Dr. Ayer. Yeah. And Dr. Ayer, I'm interested about what you said about the go or no-go triaging of patients when you have a patient who is identified as cardiogenic shock. And Dr. Kapoor identified that there are three phenotypes of uh, cardiogenic shock. How do you think that will help during the triage process? We have the type, the type one, which is the non-congested, the cardiorenal, and the cardiometabolic. So what do you think? So I think that um, irrespective of, you know, what it is, I think it's important to identify cardiogenic shocks. And we talk about go and not go. You know, I think the first thing is identification, because very often, you know, I think um, MCSs could be placed in patients which are not truly cardiogenic shocks. So when we talk about the, uh, you know, when we talk about cardiogenic shock, I think the first step is that identifying cardiogenic shock and also identifying how far out they are. Like, for example, Dr. Kapoor said, time in cardiogenic shock matters. So if there is a yeah. patient that we get a, uh, 
uh, referral from where they are, uh, you know, they are already maxed out on pressors, they have an elevated lactate, they don't have a mental status, you know, they are oliguric. I mean, we uh, identify that those are too far out. And at that point, you know, so th I think that that's what helps in uh, triaging these patients when you have a shock team. Plus, let's assume that, you know, we have identified cardiogenic shock and this patient needs more support. You know, from the get go, I think we're all in agreement as to the, uh, uh, the intensity of support that is needed. If we anticipate that patient already has a little bit of end organ dysfunction and requires longer support, we may probably end up, you know, putting an impeller 5.5 rather than an impeller CP, you know, in the cath lab. So it also depends on, uh, like you said, if it is MI, maybe they go to the cath lab, they get unloaded, they get revascularized, so it's shorter support, and then, you know, we try to wean. If it is somebody in patient with acute decompensated heart failure or in, you know, myocarditis who needs longer term support, then they get a surgical option. So I think the triage really helps us, you know, because we have all the stakeholders, we have the interventional cardiologists, we have the cardiac surgeons. Um, and so that really helps in kind of doing it early on rather than waiting. Okay. Yeah. So I invite all Dr. Dave Scher and Dr. Schindler, if you have any comments, please uh, feel free to, to ask your question and or your comment. But in a follow up to the question, Deepa. So um, once you have uh, um, uh, input um, implanted, maybe you say it's a go. So the patient will need a temporary circulatory support. So from there, how many days would you wait? And how do you decide if this patient will have to go to the next step? Right. So it is a longitudinal follow-up. I think it's a trial and error, but typically clinically what we do is we look at the patient every day. We see if the oppressor requirement is coming down. We look at, you know, whether they're, they've started to, maybe if they were oliguric, have they started to make urine? You know, we have ways, especially with the swan gans in place, we don't even need, you know, we uh, wean down the level of support for the temporary support and see if they still maintain their mean arterial pressure, that their veg acutely does not go up. So we have hemodynamic parameters, clinical management parameters to longitudinally follow these patients to decide whether if they are getting better, then of course we stick with the same. Like I said, I'm not a big fan of putting uh, percutaneous uh, temporary support device for more than, you know, uh, three to five days and uh, definitely not longer than that. And then uh, if they're getting better, then we know they can be weaned. If they are not getting better and we know they need longer duration, then that's the time to escalate. Okay. Dr. Schindler? So I, I just have a question. You know, I like adults with congenital heart disease. So uh, any comments on anybody you've taken care of, Dr. Iyer, and I mean, all these years, anybody with... Uh, pulmonary hypertension, tetralogies, whatever, anything you want to tell me, educate um, me. Yeah, sure. Actually, we have, uh, we uh, were fortunate that we had, ref uh, we had two patients who had tetralogy of fallow who were surgically corrected. Of course, in their adult life, you know, they developed um, end-stage heart failure and uh, we did take care of them, both of them. I think, I believe both of them were supported, you know, on an impeller 5.5 and both of them have received a heart transplant last year. So it was two in one year and, um, you know, they are both doing, you know, very, very well. So yes, we've had experiences with patients with adult congenital heart disease. In fact, um, it's been pretty exciting. Okay, so I have more questions. I'm very interested in your topic and I'm glad I'm moderating this so, so I can ask you directly. So uh, you're familiar with, uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with all the different uh, temporary circular support that we are using for patients in cardiogenic shock. So why do you think one would respond to this kind of support while the others won't? Will it be the theology? Will it be the stage they're in? Or will there be their age or comorbid comorbidity? So what are those factors that will influence success? Yeah. I think it will also depend on the you know level of support what they need at the time of initial you know evaluation. Like for example, if a patient comes in in acute decompensated heart failure, we know that uh, the LV is already dilated; it's not going to recover. So we know that the temporary mechanical circuitry support is not a bridge to recovery; that it is a bridge to stabilization. And once stabilized, you know, since the uh, patient already has end stage you know heart failure and the heart function is not going to improve, is a is a bridge to further decisions including advanced therapy. So in such a case, you know, this will already, we already know the patient in our clinic and they're following up with us and how they decompensate, you know that that's the next step. So at that point, we choose the biggest support available and preferably a support, you know, through the neck. So that ambulation is key to all patients. It's very important that you don't have any groin infection that they're able to ambulate because, you know, they undergo a slur of tests before they are candidates for advanced therapy. So in these patients, we by default choose surgical support
support, we keep them because we know that they are not bridged to recovery. They are a bridge to, you know, advanced therapies or, you know, so that's kind of what we do. Now, if the person comes in an acute MI and then obviously, um, you know, he's had a stunned myocardium, you unload the heart, you revascularize, the revascularization is successful. And then at that point, it is going to be a smaller temporary support device. You know, we don't need complete support, but you need to just tighten the time of myocardial stunning. And then uh, you're pretty confident that you'd be able to wean them off in the next couple of days. So I, um, somebody with myocarditis, I still remember a young girl who came in, you know, with acute fulminant myocarditis. In fact, Dr. Dulman did an absolute like, you know, uh, a biopsy during that process. One of the few times we do a biopsy to really get a clinical diagnosis because um, it, uh, you know, that uh, makes a change in what the outcomes are. And I think this, you know, she was initially supported on an ECMO, but the cannulas were so big and she started developing, you know, limb ischemia. So we then changed her over, you know, to have an impeller, you know, on from the axillary artery approach. It was a surgical, you know, placement. And then she had a protect geo on the right side, again, through the neck, so we could spare the groin. And then ultimately, you know, we supported her and she improved to the point that she was completely explanted. And not only that, she was on guideline-directed medical therapy and she has also had LV recovery. So, um, you know, again, sometimes you have to longitudinally follow these patients and then decide what the next best step is depending on their clinical response and their hemodynamic parameters. Okay, right. Okay, anyone else? Dr. Shenley, any more? No, I have just have one more, Dr. Ayer. So recently, what is your take about uh, Impella? And I know this might not be related because you're talking about advanced heart failure, but I think the me me mechanism, the pathophysiology is the same. With a DTU trial that we're now gonna use Impella, prior to revascularization. What do you think? What are your thoughts about that? I think that's the next step because there is enough evidence that shows that unloading in the setting of cardiogenic shock, like I explained in all those trials, does help not only 30-day uh, mortality, mortality to you know discharge. I mean, it's also longer. And I think we are just translating what we already know in this picture to those patients. Again, you know, the patient selection is key. That's why we're not selecting any patient who comes in with acute myocardial infarct. We are specifically targeting those patients who have the LAD because it's going to anticipate a larger area of myocardium, which is compromised. And even though it is revascularized, there would be stunning, there could be reperfusion arrhythmias. And so, you know, the thought that we are first unloading and, you know, causing increased perfusion during the unloading period, because you are decreasing the myocardial oxygen demand of that muscle, which is acutely ischemic, is really novel. And I think you're just translating that. So time will tell. I mean, I'm sure that it's going to, like I said, the paradigm shifts are always difficult, you know, when uh, uh, Dr. Naveen Kapoor initially introduced the concept of unloading before revascularization, we were always so conscious about door to balloon time. And right. then there was a concept of door to unloading in cardiogenic shock. And I think we are translating that into our, you know, our clinical setting here. And the same thing too, many years ago, I'm sure Dr. Schindler, you know this too, that we never used beta blocker. And then suddenly now we're using beta blockers for heart failure. During my training, that wasn't known no, because it seems like beta blockers will just, you know, uh, aggravate the heart failure, but now we just turned into using it as a, pro, uh, as a first line um, medication yeah. for our treatment for heart failure. So those are the kinds of the, so I'm just talking historical. You may not be, you might still be in grade school, Dr. Ayer, during that time, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, beta blockers is one of those which were loved, hated, loved. So we've gone yeah. through a lot of phase of with that. Right, okay. All right. Well, I think um, if there are no more questions or comments, we're right on time, Dr. Ayer. You're 601, and we were able to tackle so many things. I was we were able to ask questions. And of course, my personally, my own satisfaction too, because I, I was really very interested. So congratulations on your talk. So thank you all very much for attending this. Uh, uh, grand rounds and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.